All right. So um, I'll go straight back to where we ended yesterday, essentially, um, and just, just continue for another one and a half hours. So yesterday, we, we had this sort of relaxed afternoon of just looking at lots and lots of animated pretty pictures. And the point of all of this was, uh, well, to, to do essentially, well, three things. The first one was to point out that Gaussians are great because they have all these great algebraic properties and we use them not necessarily because they are a great exact model of the world, but because they provide a rich algebra for do com for, uh, to do computations with. And then uh, I spoke at length about this idea of parametric regression, which, in, which uses nonlinear features to model nonlinear functions. And actually, someone asked me afterwards whether there's any limitation on what kind of features you can use. And as far as I know, there's no limitation. So you, you can really use whichever feature you come up with. They don't have to be uh, continuous, as we noticed yesterday from the step functions. They don't even have to be local. So you can have features that have sort of non-zero shape at sort of dis uh, distant regions far apart from each other. You can really use whatever you like to encode the shape of the function or, the, or to, to build a language for functions that you are actually interested in. That's a real strength of this parametric framework that you're so free to choose how you're going to describe your function. Then we moved on and realized that for some features, we can do this kind of limit process where we increase the number of features more and more and more until we reach a point where a sum turns into an integral and we have essentially an infinite number of features. So we actually use an infinite number of features to describe a space of functions. And that's also called a kernel and this is called non-parametric regression. The corresponding probability distribution over the weights on these features amounts to an infinite dimensional distribution over numbers. A Gauss, a, well, not really a Gaussian distribution because it's infinite dimensional and maybe this is not the right word. So we come up with a new word for it and this is called a Gaussian process. But it's really just a limit process. There's, there's very little extra structure added. Okay, so, but those were just mostly pretty pictures, right? So now we need to figure out, and this is actually this wonderful question by uh, Krikamol at the end of, of, of the talk, how do we actually build these models? So now that we know that there are so many of them, how do we decide which one to use? And how do we actually use them in a realistic setting? So um, I'll begin the sort of thought process of how to build these models by essentially just repeating all the arguments that Bernhard did on Thursday, but with pretty pictures. Right. So um, I'll mostly leave out the maths that, on, that that's on top. These are these very simple, uh, or mostly very simple proofs that Bernhard already mentioned, or that they're actually so simple you don't even like. I don't even need to mention them, and just see what these individual ways of combining kernels or sort of changing kernels to keep the kernel property amount to in terms of modeling. So that one of the first things Bernhard said is, if k is a kernel, then any positive scalar constant times that kernel is also a kernel. Obviously, because um, if k is a positive definite matrix, then some positive scalar times that k is still a positive definite matrix because a positive number times a positive number is a positive number. So uh, let's say we use this everyone's favorite kernel, this square exponential. By the way, we have to think later on about why this is actually everyone's favorite kernel. But for the moment, let's just say that's everyone's favorite kernel. Um, this is this, this kernel, which, is this, which looks like a Gaussian, has this kind of Gaussian shape. And nobody wants to call it a Gaussian because it's sort of confusing. People think it has something to do with Gaussian processes, which it doesn't. It's just a kernel, right? Which is why in the Gaussian process community, it's sometimes also called square exponential, um, which is a bit weird because it's not actually the square of an exponential. It's the exponential of a square. Other people call it RBF, radial basis functions, which is also a bit weird because there are lots of other functions which are also radial and which are also basis functions. So we are we really stuck with these weird names that they, they, don't, they don't work very well, but that's just what we say. Okay, so if you use this particular kernel um, and multiply it by one in front, which is, meaning, well, which is like multiplying it with nothing, then um, uh, this is what our problem looks like. And by scaling the uh, the, the kernel is by a factor of 10. Well, actually, this is what the posterior looks like. By scaling it by 10, there's actually a quite major change in the prior. What, what this, what this uh, scalar in front essentially does is it widens the, the distribution over the outputs. One way of thinking about that is the, the, that the marginal variance of the function value at every point is exactly that number, because this kernel itself um, at equal input points is just one. So 
the variance of the function at every point is literally this number. And here it's 10, so 2 times 10 is 20, which is why you sort of barely see this line up here. 2 times 1 is 2, which is why you see this variance here. Okay. Um, an interesting, ob interesting thing is that this really changes, well, it, well, okay, it's not really that interesting, but it really changes the behavior of the posterior, this tiny number in front. So if you're currently using a kernel in your kernel regression scheme, which doesn't have a number in front, maybe you need to change that. Right? So here's the first parameter that suddenly enters your sort of thought process. Now you have to think about how to choose this. Okay. Now, something else that Bernhard said is that that's actually a very interesting property that I think is underused. And that is that if you have a kernel, K, then, um, which has two inputs, A and B, then um, if you take any feature function, literally any, whatever function you can come up with, then the kernel of that feature function applied to the original inputs is also a kernel. And this feature function might well actually change the dimensionality of the input. This could be a four-dimensional input, and this might be a square exponential over four-dimensional input, and this could be a one-dimensional input, and this could be a square exponential over one-dimensional input. The most simplistic way in which people use this all the time is to do a linear rescaling of A and B. So if you just take A and B and just uh, well, multiply them by 1, or actually, no, you, you divide them by 5, this is what I do here, um, then you get a prior which looks like this, and a posterior which looks like this. Okay, this is a very sort of smooth uh, posterior distribution, which smooths out a lot of structure here. And if you take A and just multiply it by 2, so it's essentially just taking the difference between the two plots I'm showing you, it's just multiplying by 10. Right? Then the of the inputs. Then the prior looks very different. You get much more sort of active dynamic uh, functions, and the posterior is a lot more kind of flexible in some sense. This is usually called a length scale, and it's something that many of you have seen before. So here is one more parameter. If you're currently using a square exponential kernel without scaling the inputs, now you suddenly have to start thinking about how you should scale these inputs because it has a massive effect on the posterior distribution or uh, well, even this mean prediction here in the middle. Okay, something else. Uh, well, of course, you can actually, by the way, also use this in a nonlinear way. So, for example, you could say I'm scaling the inputs not by a constant, but maybe I'm squaring them. Right? So, this is you take the input, you add 9, you divide by 5, and then you take the square of this. Then, this is what the feature looks like. And that now means you have essentially sort of a local length scale. So now you have a, a prior over functions which says in the corner over here I'm expecting very smooth functions that change very slowly. And over here I have a region where the function where I'm expecting the function values to change very quickly and more and more quickly. Um, and that gives you this kind of posterior. There's, this is a very interesting idea that I think is underused. There's actually also a danger in using this though. If you use a, a nonlinear rescaling here, which is non-monotonic, so that it, it, it ends up mapping two points of the input space to the same location. And you can introduce very long-range interactions between function, function values. And this can be something you might be looking for. It can also be something very dangerous. One way in which you might want to use this is to introduce periodicity. So if you take the inputs and scale them by, well, for example, the sign, then you're essentially mapping uh, the function value every multiple of uh, depending on how you think about it, either every multiple of pi or every multiple of 2 pi to the same function value. And what comes out are functions that are periodic. So you can see that these are, these are clearly periodic functions. Um, so for this particular data set, I'm ex using this on this is a very silly idea. But maybe you have a function that actually is periodic. Edgar here, for example, works with periodical functions. So for the, the simulation of dynamical systems which have recurring errors, this might be a very powerful framework. Okay. Um, so that was... Scaling the output of a kernel is a kernel. Scaling the input of a kernel is a kernel. Now, Bernard also said the sum of two kernels is again a kernel. So here is the sum of two square exponential kernels, one with a very sh relatively short length scale, one with a relatively long length scale. You can see this up here. Kernel 1, kernel 2, and the overall kernel is just the sum of two. Now, one way of thinking about kernels, as Bernard already said, is as a measure of similarity. I, prefer, I think I prefer the term measure of relatedness in function values, because there's also negative similarity, which is like 
which is sort of a difficult way, or maybe not the right way of using this word, right? So strong anti-correlation means that two function values are also strongly related to each other. They influence each other quite a lot. They are just very different from each other. So um, using this notion, this summation amounts to a logical or. So this sum kernel is a kernel that makes two function values similar to each other if they are similar under either the first kernel or the second kernel. So one way of using this is to construct models which are sort of which have some sort of low very uh, low uh, output variance short length scale structure. So this can, can, can now this kernel can, can sort of capture this complicated internal structure, but also capture some long range structure. So this these the sum of two kernels can actually allow you to sort of get this overall trend that the function value moves upwards. Um, there's, a, there's, there's actually a very powerful way of using this, um, which arises from combining kernels with parametric models. And in fact, this is actually, I think, one of the most like, important things to take away from, from this kind of kernel algebra, that you can also take a parametric model, which is essentially a kernel that has finite degrees of freedom, and then add a non-parametric model on top. And that allows you to do something like this. So this is a, a square exponential kernel, this one here, plus um, literally an inner product between a bunch of features. In this case, it's, it's uh, polynomial features, constant, linear, quadratic. And what that gives you is a model that says, I'm expecting the function overall to have a kind of a bowl shape, or maybe an inverted bowl shape, but also locally to actually move up and down a little bit. And this can be a very good description for functions like this. And I think if that, that's an idea that if you uh, if some of you had used it in some of the previous practicals on, on kernels by Francesco and Peter, this might have been a very powerful idea to build a good model. Because you can think about the overall structure of your data set. You think, okay, this is sort of something like this, but then there's also a complicated local structure. And combine them in this, in this way. Right? You can say the overall structure that's captured by the parametric model and the local structure that's captured by a non-parametric model. This is a very powerful way of, of building models. Okay, so just to point this out again, of course, the input to these kernels doesn't have to be one-dimensional. It can, might as well be two-dimensional. In fact, very often it's very high-dimensional. And then building these models becomes more, more difficult because it's harder to think about these high-dimensional inputs. And as you'll hear over the course of today um, from, from Thomas Hoffmann, the inputs don't even have to be real numbers at all. There's lots and lots of other objects that you can build kernels on. For example, uh, Carsten Borgwart, who's going to talk tomorrow, um, has made uh, great contributions to building kernels over graphs. Where so if you have graph structured inputs and you would like to measure the similarity between two graphs. You can also have, um, as I said yesterday, the output be something else than just a real number. It could be several real numbers, or maybe if you manage to get to, to get to, to take uh, to, to find some interesting topological structure that amounts to a Euclidean space between non real number of valued outputs, you can even construct predictions over structured objects, objects that aren't actually just real numbers. You'll hear more about this in the, sec in the next talk after this. Okay. Um, this two-dimensional idea, though, brings, brings up something interesting about, uh, about the way of, of, of constructing kernels. You could also say, I'm going to, to construct a model over functions which consists of two kernels, one kernel which only takes account the shape of the function in one dimension, plus a kernel which only uh, takes inputs in the other dimension. This is called an additive model, and this is, this is uh, one example of this. This is two square exponentials. This is a very different model from just multiplying them or just building a kernel over all the inputs. It has, you know, in a sense, less degrees of freedom. It's sort of more restrictive. But people use these methods to construct um, A uh, models which are computationally less expensive than the general case, and B, to find functional relationships between inputs. So this is obviously a question you might sometimes have. I have a 40-dimensional uh, problem, and I actually believe this doesn't have 40 degrees of freedom. I assume it just actually has two or three degrees of freedom. What are those degrees of freedom? So let's find a sum of two kernels which only take linear combinations of the inputs as inputs, such that I, des I described the function well. This is called functional ANOVA. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, Grace Baba wrote about it in 1990 already. Okay, and then finally, Bernhard also said the product, the pointwise product of two kernels, 
is also a kernel. So the pointwise product is, the, is what MATLAB calls point star. Right? And showing that this is, f is true is actually completely non-trivial. Um, you can look up a proof in a quite nice tech report um, by, um, I forgot her first name, Miss Milan. Um, it's actually about two pages long. So this is completely non-trivial. Um, and so this is sort of the opposite, in a sense, to, the, to, to addition. If addition is a logical or, so two function values are similar to each other if they're similar under either one kernel or the other kernel, or both obviously, then the product, of course, is only a large number if both numbers are large. So um, multiplying two kernels can, is, is a way of constructing models which encode similarity under two measures at the same time, two measures of similarity at the same time. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to see this structure in this kind of plot. So you can stare at it for a while and notice some interesting structure. Okay. Um, so here, is, here are all these sentences again. So these are essentially exactly the same things that Bernhard said. But I hope you maybe now have a slightly better idea of how to use these properties to actually influence what your model looks like. This is actually an algebra of to, that can be used to construct expressive models over functions. It's not just, not just sort of an... an an algebraic structure that is just sort of interesting to know. It's actually something that helps you make build, build better models. Um, it also means that you now have this huge sort of amount of freedom to design your model. Suddenly, you need to think about all the scalars in front that you so far set to one. You have to wonder about all the length scales in, in your kernels, which you so far set to one. You have to wonder about all the other kernels you might have to add to get a good model, all the other kernels you might have to multiply with to get a, get a, good, a good kernel. So suddenly, you're faced with this huge problem of having to choose between all these models. And of course, in many ways, this is what machine learning is about. Right? We'd like to have algorithms which do this automatically to a large, large degree. But I have to say, actually, so far, we're not at this point yet. There's, I, I know of very few algorithms or very few implementations that actually automatically try to search this huge space of kernels. There was one paper at ICML this year. Um, I forgot the entire set of, of, of authors, but I think uh, our colleague David Duvino was a co-author on, on them, um, which, where people tried to do this. And there's some very interesting results coming out. Um, maybe you would just want to have a look at this. ICML 2013. Okay. But what people have thought about in the past a lot is how to sort out individual scalar parameters in a kernel. So uh, if you, for example, have to choose the order of a polynomial in a polynomial regression model, or if you have to choose your signal variance or your length scale in a simple regression model, or the noise on an observation model, on a likelihood, that's something we now have a rough idea of how to do this, and it involves hierarchical Bayesian inference that Zubin already talked about. It's actually a very straightforward idea. Uh, and again, it makes use of the great properties of, of, of Gaussian distributions. So essentially what we're doing so far is we started out with a prior on the function, which is a Gaussian process. So it's this sort of interesting algebraic object. And a likelihood over the observations, which is itself a Gaussian, so this is a Gaussian distribution, this is itself a Gaussian distribution. And now, so far what we've asked for is the posterior distribution over this function, given this observation. But we could also ask for the normalizer in Bayes' theorem, which is uh, simply the marginal probability over the observations given the model parameters, so given everything that's not the function. So for that, we have, to, we have to apply the sum rule. You integrate out the function value. This might look like a complicated thing, but because both of these are Gaussian distributions, this product is itself a Gaussian distribution, and this marginalization is straightforward, in fact. It's a very simple Gaussian integral, and I've already written down what the answer is. So if you have independent Gaussian likelihoods for the observations and a Gaussian process prior with a mean and covariance function, then this is the marginal likelihood for the observations. Now, this is a likelihood. It's a likelihood for the parameters of the model. So everything that's in this function and in this function and this little number here, these are all parameters of this model. And this function here is a likelihood for all of these parameters. It's a probability distribution over y, but it's not necessarily a probability distribution over the other parameters. It's also quite obviously not a Gaussian function over those parameters in here. So this k is some complicated kernel, and it involves some parameters. And it has some general, general form and shape. So this function, as a function of these parameters, is a complicated thing that isn't necessarily Gaussian. Nevertheless, we can use it as a likelihood in Bayes' theorem 
together with some prior somewhere, and you might think about whether you need that prior or not. Maybe in some cases it can be an uninformative prior, in some cases it needs to be quite informative to perform inference on these hyperparameters. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I want to get to a more interesting example, but uh, here, is just an, here is just a very, very simple, simple example picture of this. I, t I took the exact same function that you've now seen about 40 times, this blue set of, of data points. I said I've decided to use a square exponential kernel on this. So that is a decision I fixed. There's no inference over that. I've also decided I know what the, sh what the size of the error bars on each of these plotted points are. I've just kept them at what they were at in all the plots so far. So that's another decision I've taken. I've fixed that number. I've also decided that the signal variance, so the scalar in front of the kernel, should be 1. I've also fixed that decision. Not going to do inference on that. The only number I care about is I've decided the feature transformation of the input of the kernel is going to be a linear transformation, and it's going to be a length scale, so it's just one number. And that I would like to know a probability distribution for. Um, and here I'm plotting the, this particular this log likelihood for this parameter in log space, so this is the logarithm of this distribution. You can see that it's not a Gaussian distribution at all, it's actually asymmetric. However, if you actually plot it, like the actual probability distribution, so if you plot x of this, it's actually a very peaked, sharp distribution. So for this particular setting, if we decide every other parameter of the model is fixed, we're actually pretty, sh pretty certain about what this length scale parameter should be, at least in a probabilistic sense. Um, and now, so now, if you would like to decide what this parameter should be, obviously there's sort of the obvious thing to, if you just stare at this, is to say, well, this is such a sort of thin distribution, maybe it's just this, just this value here, right? But in general, this is not a good idea. If, if your distribution isn't as peaked and as local as this, you might, you might throw away a lot of uncertainty by fixing this parameter to just one particular value. And then what people do is they do Markov chain Monte Carlo inference, um, because it's more or less one of the only things we know how to do well in these kind of unstructured uh, integration problems. So here's an example of that. I've chosen, I've now, I've now left the space a little bit more open. I also, I'm also uncertain about the noise on the observations, and I'm uncertain about the scale of the function, and I'm uncertain about the length scale. So that's three parameters. Then I ran uh, a Markov J Monte Carlo sampler on this. I actually forgot to put a citation here somewhere. My, I'm using my favorite uh, MCMC method, which is elliptical slice sampling by Ian Murray. Um, this is something you can just take off the shelf and just run with it. I just ran it for about a thousand samples. You see three samples here. Um, and for each sample, I drew a sample from the corresponding Gaussian process. So for each sample of the hyperparameters, I decided that might be a good model. Let's draw some samples from the Gaussian process. And you see one sample each from these three samples. So this posterior distribution over Gaussian process models says, well, it could be that this is a very smooth function. It might be this sample here, which also has quite low noise on the observations. It could also be that it's a less smooth function, that's this one here, which has more noise on the inputs, and it sort of moves up and down a little bit more. Or it could be a very irregular function that moves up and down a lot, but has very little noise. Now, which of these it is depends almost entirely on my prior assumptions, actually. If I would decide that I don't expect these very irregular functions, then the only way to really encode this is by prior assumption. And that's something that's going to sort of be a theme for the next half hour as well. You have to make quite strict prior assumptions over these sort of powerful spaces of hypotheses to, to nail down the, the distribution to something meaningful. Of course, the alternative is to just set the parameters to sort of their most likely value. And this is actually something many people do in regression. And it works relatively well in this kind of case. It can also, it not necess it, it, but it doesn't have to work well. Right? Maximum likelihood can be, can be a good estimator if the posterior is already very strongly constrained. Um, it can also be a very bad estimator if the posterior is still very broad. Um, this is what you would get out for maximum likelihood, by the way. OK. Um, so this is good. I tried to get through this relatively quickly. So um, what, I'm try what I've tried to say in this part of the, of the talk is that um, A, there, there is this, this kernel algebra. So, so the sum of kernels are kernels, the product of kernels are kernels, scale, scaled values of kernels are kernels, and scaled inputs of, of, scaling the inputs of kernels also gives you back a kernel. Um, 
That means you have this huge space of kernels to choose from, or parametric, non-parametric models to choose from. How do you do that? Well, mostly you do it by just fixing things. You just decide you're going to use a particular model. I think this is what Chris Bishop meant by model-based learning. You make a big set of assumptions before you start, and then ideally you're left with a small number of parameters you still need to fix, and then there's various ways of doing that. One of them is hierarchical Bayesian inference that I just sort of quickly alluded to here. Obviously, I didn't give you the full picture. Um, this is strongly related to what Zubin did in his talk, so I'm sort of glossing over it a little bit. There's obviously also other, op other options of doing this. You could do cross-validation, you could do whatever you like in your particular model. However, the problem with this is that it's always conditional on some prior assumptions. It's always conditional on deciding which kernels you're going to use, on deciding uh, how you, how you're, uh, what, what kind of overall scale of parameters you're expecting. If you don't do that, then your model is always entirely underspecified. Okay, so how would you actually do this in real life? Like, how do you actually build a model from, like, given this huge set of decisions that you have to take? And how do you live with the decisions that this model then actually takes? So for the next half hour, I'd like to do a particular case example that I have been preparing for the past four years. So in uh, 2009, I was living in Cambridge doing my PhD and I was unhappy with my body weight, mostly because the f like, so I was living in a, in a college in Cambridge which had very good food and I kept eating a lot and I gained a lot of weight. So uh, in 2009, I got really annoyed with this and I started trying to lose weight. This is my body weight over the course of the past four years. I'm, I've obviously cunningly left out the values on the y-axis. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you that each, between each of these two lines, it's two kilograms. So you get a rough idea of what's happened over these past four years. Okay, so um, I stepped on a scale almost every morning. This is, what the, this is the first thing I did was I, I bought a scale. And I stepped on a scale every morning, and I've been recording this mostly over the past four years. Okay, so this is what this data set looks like, okay? And now you could say, well, I would like to have a descriptive model of what's going on here. I would like to, to, to have, have a regression model that tells me what's going to happen in the future. Ideally, I'd like to have a model that tells me what to do to get to sort of control this weight better. I think this is sort of a setting that maybe many people can relate to, especially after this summer school. <laughs> and I've, also, I've also actually conveniently left out the, the data set ends here a week before the summer school. So. <laughs> okay, so how do you build a model for this? Do you just, just like take out your Gaussian process toolbox and just use the square exponential kernel and just let it run? Exactly. So these points are not IID. Is, are there any points in the real world that are IID? See, there's people shaking their heads. Uh, someone is like, oh, maybe one or two. Yeah, okay, maybe I can make constructions that are, yeah. But, but real data sets typically look like this. There's a lot of structure in that. And in fact, I can tell you what that structure is. So in the in, uh, very first thing I tried was I tried to lose some weight. I just ate less. I just didn't go to, to the college canteen anymore. Okay. Uh, didn't work out so well. Then... I, this was the most successful part. I had a buddy living, uh, who shared, shared an office with me, Carl Scheffler, who w wanted to go running. So for half a year, we went on seri a serious running mission. We prepared a half marathon. We went running four times a week, uh, always more than 7K, sometimes half marathons. That worked really well, and I lost weight like crazy. And I kept eating like crazy as well. <laughs> Great. Then, this is NIPS, NIPS 2009. Uh, I, was, I was running on a treadmill in, uh, back then in, the, in, in, uh, in Vancouver, uh, and, then, and it was great, and I felt really, really wonderful, and then I flew home to my mom, and it was Christmas. <laughs> and something really bad happened in between, right? <laughs> and then Carl left, and he, he, did, he did some time in Afghanistan, and he was, he was gone, and I didn't go on runs anymore. So I was just on my own. So I gained all my weight back. I call that slacking, because I, I this really didn't, didn't work out. Um, also, sometime around this time, I wrote out my PhD and everything just com went completely haywire. Then I moved to Tübingen and I said I need to get my life in order. Also, I, got I finally got away from this, from this cafeteria in Cambridge that kept feeding me. So I finally managed to get my uh, f uh, food intake under control. I just ate less again and I lost some weight again. But then I sort of settled into life in, in, at the Max Planck Institute and just sort of stopped thinking about things and sort of did science instead. So then my weight sort of started creeping up again. And then in early 2012, or sort of mid-2012, I started going to a gym, sort of start, try, try something else again. 
And I've been since actually been doing this ever since, up until the summer school started. Uh, and then in between, just to sort of prepare this experiment, actually, something I also tried was um, two, two months ago, for a month, I decided to just eat vegetarian food, so no meat whatsoever, to just see whether there's an effect or not. Okay? So that gives us a description of what's actually going on behind this data set. Now, in many real-world applications, you don't know this underlying structure this well. And then the problem is a lot harder. Then you have to come up with models that find these change points in the data set. And there are people who do that. I'm not going to talk about it at all. It's actually a very challenging problem. Instead, I've just decided I know exactly where these phases start and end. Okay? So now, that's actually making the problem relatively easy, but there's still this whole space of models that we have to choose from. What kernel are we going to use? What features should we use? Any proposals? Just shout something out, doesn't matter whether it's good or not. A periodic kernel, that's a very interesting idea. Yeah. No, it's actually a very interesting idea. So, so there's obviously, there, 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 there's surely some periodical structure in there. For sure, there's a 12-month period in this, in this process, because every Christmas I keep, I keep gaining weight. Um, there's probably also a weekly structure in there, because every week, uh, like weekends are different from the rest of the week. So there's certainly some periodical structure in there. I'm not actually going to use a periodical structure. I would also, I would like to know what these individual sort of features of my lifestyle actually do to me. I would like to have a descriptive model that says, if, if I go to the gym, this is what happens. And if I stop, if, if, I, if I try to eat less, this is what happens. If I go running, this is what happens. And that is very difficult to encode with a kernel. Instead, I'm going to use a parametric model. I'm going to use a very, very simplistic model that makes a very strong statement about what's going on there. Um, by the way, just to drive from this point, you could also say, this, this, is what this is what would happen if you just chose to use a kernel. So here I've, I've used the Wiener process, the, the min kernel. You could also use a square exponential. It doesn't really matter. Um, if you just use, a, use, a, just use a, a, a stationary process, then you get a very boring stationary prediction. And this is completely useless, right? It's just a line that goes through all the points. That's maybe nice for interpolation. Maybe if, you want, if, you, if I want to know what my, what my body weight was in this region here where I didn't measure myself, okay, that's good. But if I actually want to predict the future, this, this, this kind of framework doesn't help at all. Okay, so instead, we're going to use a very structured model. So I'm going to say there are four, five different things I tried. So I, went on, I, I started running, I dieted, I ate less, I went to the gym, I ate vegetarian for a while, and I slacked off. These are five things. Each of these things does something, has a constant effect. So every day that I go running, I lose a certain amount of weight. So it has an effect on the derivative of my, uh, uh, of, no, it has, it has a linear effect on my weight. It's a constant derivative and gives me a linear change. So these are these features up here that you see in the background. So um, this blue one here, this is for going to the gym. This red one is for um, slacking off. And the green one is for going on runs. So these are functions that are constant. If I don't do this particular sort of lifestyle choice, then they are linear if I follow this particular lifestyle choice, and then they just stay constant on the top again. Um, and the advantage of this is that I can, this, this kind of feature I can apply at the end again. I can say, what would happen if I would now start running again? OK? Um, but that's not all. There's something else on top of this as well. And that I'm, I've decided, I've just decided to model with three particular processes. The first one is that there are random steps up and down in my weight. So there are certain things happening in my body um, where I just, for some sort of weird random process that I don't fully understand, sort of my, my weight just sort of jumps up a tiny little bit from one day to the next or maybe from one week to the next. And these are things that change my weight and it actually stays in this way. So this is things like, um, I went to a wedding last weekend and I just ate like crazy and that just added something to my weight and I'll have to do something active to get that down again. Okay? Then, th th that I'm going to model with the Wiener process because that's exactly what the Wiener process is. It's a random process that does a random walk that actually moves away and sort of moves to ever larger and smaller spaces. It's a, it's a random walk. 
Then there are also fluctuations. There has something to do with how much water I drank that day and whether I was well hydrated or not, or I don't know whether the sun was shining or not. These are fluctuations in my body weight that just go up and down, up and down, and they don't stay that way. They're not additive to my body weight. They're just fluctuations up and down. For those, I use a square exponential kernel because that's a stationary process. That's not a random walk. It's a stationary function that stays within one region. Okay? And I use a length scale, that which initially I set to one day, that S is completely crap. Or if you see SS anywhere on the, on the slides, it's because I have a nervous habit of pressing Control S to save, save things. I'm sure that happens to you as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then finally, also my, my scale obviously is imperfect. Uh, it has, according to its, producer, to its uh, manufacturer, a, a precision of, sorry, this is incorrect, 0.1 kilograms, so 100 grams. I should have corrected that. Okay, and that's just fixed. I'm never going to ch think about that. I just assume that that's, that's actually correct. And I'm pretty sure this is actually correct on my weight. So this gives me this very complicated model, actually. So the covariance function between function values here is that there is some effect from uh, this sort of fluctuation up and down. That's a square exponential kernel with a length scale, which I um, need to figure out. And um, with an overall contribution to my overall uh, body weight behavior, which I also need to figure out. There is also um, this overall effect of this random walk, which we need to figure out. And there is an overall effect, or actually this is incorrect, so I have, I have individual effect strengths for each of these individual things that I'm doing. So for going on runs, for eating less, for snacking off, for going to the gym, and for eating, eating vegetarian. Okay? That's a complicated, complicated model, but it produces relatively interesting data. Now, how do you assess whether that's a good model or not? Exactly. You generate some random data. That's what Zubin said earlier on as well. That's, the, that's one of the main strengths of a probabilistic model. You just draw from the prior and see what it looks like. And that's actually what I've done up there. So this green thing in the background, that's this prior distribution. And I've drawn here two data sets at random from the generative process. Can you see the two data sets? There are actually three, right? Oh, because the third one, that's the real data set. Can you see the difference between the three? Between them? Can, you, can you tell me which one is the real data set? Just about, right? Because you remember some of the structure. Because you remember there's this step up sometime around 2010. But they actually look very similar, right? Do you, do you agree that this is a relatively realistic model? So that's something you can do with your real data as well. OK, it's particularly easy here because it's a one-dimensional problem. OK, I can make a plot. It's fine, right? If you work with images, it's a lot harder. If, you're, if your data set has a 400-dimensional, um, well, it's 400-dimensional, then it's very hard to do these kind of plots. But people have gone to great lengths to do that. There, there's, there, there's a, I think, a whole group in Toronto working on this kind of visual representation of sample data. I've got a question. Um, well, I'm essentially doing it in the same term, and I'm just adding the two. But, but, they are, but they are actually two different things. So there's, there's a difference between, let me just draw this, between... What is the classical framework? Um, um, no, no. So th this is Gaussian noise. So these are, if I would draw, I, I didn't do that. But if I, well, actually, I had them on, on, on yesterday's, yesterday's plots. You can see all three of these cases. So a draw from a Wiener process looks like, looks like this. So the important thing is, it's a random walk. It doesn't stay within one region. So it goes up and down, up and down, but it actually sort of drifts away over time. And the distance from the original starting point is proportional to the square root of time. Right? And it moves away further and further. It's a very classical model, actually. It's thermodynamics. It's Brownian, Brownian motion. Right? This other, th this thing here, that's a function that looks like this. So it stays within one region, but it moves randomly up and down, but it has structure. So if you would zoom in, you would see a function that looks like, looks like this. 
It's not just noise. While this process here, that's measurement noise. Every day I, I step on my scale, at a, I, it's a completely separate random number that's drawn as the, as the error of my, of my scale. So if I would draw from that, it would look like dust. Right? And there's no point in drawing a line between them because they are literally independently drawn numbers. So that's three very different kind of things. From very far away, they might look similar, but they are, but they are st structurally very different. This is, a, this is a smooth, infinitely often differentiable function which stays within one region, but has a particular length scale. This is a random walk that walks away from the, from the starting point, and this is just dust. It's just IID drawn numbers. This one, you mean? I, I actually have I actually have sort of a physical model in mind of th of three different kinds of effects. This is I step on a scale now and I get a, a sort of it says I don't know uh, forty two point six two kilograms, right? And I step off again and I try again and it says forty two point seven and I step off again and it says forty two point five eight, right? That's literally just this device that I'm stepping on making an error every time it measures me. That's this. And I could repeat this over and over again, and I get completely different numbers, well, within this scale, completely different numbers every time. And the next number has nothing to do with the previous number up to the overall mean. While this thing is, if I would, like, if I would take this out, if I had a scale that was perfect, perfect in its measurement, then if I would repeat my measurements 10 times now, they would look exactly the same every time. And if I did it again in half an hour, it would be ever so slightly different. It would be this overall smooth effect. And it would, it would be a little bit less because I didn't drink water while I was talking and I was sweating and I just lost, lost a little bit of weight. But as soon as I drink this water, I'll be back at the original weight. So there's sort of something in ha this just sort of how much, like what are the contents of your, of your digestive system essentially? I didn't want to say that out loud previously, but that's really actually what's behind this, right? There's sort of an overall smooth variation that's just things passing through your body, water and food, right? And then there's something else, which is, I went to the machine learning summer school for two weeks and I just gained some weight. And it's just not part of this model yet, so I have to somehow include it. I need to have to get these fluctuations in. And that's something that is not going to just, van that is just going to vanish again over time. It's just actually there. Like, being here for two weeks and eating this much food does something to your body and you have to actively do something to, re to reduce your weight again. Okay? Michael. Oh, I did. I did. So, so these features here, these are I, actually in the MATLAB code for this. There is literally a function that says if the that literally encodes this function. Well, it's really just a bit of a hacky, ugly piece of MATLAB code that gives you exactly these functions. So these are linear functions which have a constant gain, which is why this one is higher than the yellow one because the yellow one was only active for a very short time. Um, this is this is vegetarian diet here somewhere. And the red one, which was slacking off, was on for quite a long time, which is sort of why it's higher up. So they are all positive here, and of course I'm, I'm expecting that not all of them are positive. But that doesn't matter, right? I'm, going to, I'm looking for a particular linear weight that will tell me what the overall effect of these is. So if I would multiply this by, I don't know, some number, 5 or 10 or whatever, then you would see that then it would, it would, it would sort of go up, right? It would become a bigger effect. And if I had multiplied by minus five, it would become a big negative effect. And in fact, these things have physical units. This is, this is an actual physical model. So as a physicist, I'm really keen about the units. This, these things have the units kilograms per day. Or actually grams per day. I think this is how I encoded them. It's really what happens to your body if you go running. How, how many grams per day do you lose or do you gain? Okay? And this, these scalars in front of you, they have units as well. They are... This is kilogram squared, this is kilogram squared, and the length scale in here is... Um, days. Time. Right? Okay? Which is that? Okay, so, so, so the question is, there's, or the statement is, there's an important latent variable missing here, which is the calorie intake. And that's exactly right. Of course. If only I had for the past four years written down everything I ate. <laughs> right? And if only I knew how many calories were actually in there. But I don't. 
Um, I could. So if you have a physical model of what happens to your body weight as a function of calories you take, you, you take in, if you have a very precise model for that, and people have done that, so there are sports scientists who have tried this before, then you can try and infer your uh, calorie intake from that. But then if you only do that, of course, there'd be someone else sitting at the other end of the room which says, oh, there's an important latent variable missing, which is all the things you did, right? You went on runs, you dieted for a while. Well, dieting, okay, is actually calorie intake, right? But you went, on, you went running, you went to the gym, you did all sorts of complicated things which sh that, that you don't account for here. So that's, you need to tell me that as well. Because I think actually a relatively realistic physical model of your, your body weight is that there's two parameters that actually um, determine it. And one of them is physical activity, and one of them is calorie intake. Right? Unfortunately, I didn't measure them. So what I'm building here is a very simplistic model. Exactly. So for the people in the observation room, um, uh, the statement in the, in the back is that actually there's a lot more structure to calories. A calorie is not a calorie. There are, there are uh, sugar calories and there are starch calories and there are fat calories and they have very different effects. That's true. So really, this, I think the mental picture you could have in your head to describe this kind of problem is that the input domain here is not time, but Maybe it's, well, so your statement is the input domain is actually time, calorie intake, and energy exp ex 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 expen expenditure, right? So how much, how much uh, body activity you, 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 you had. But actually, your statement is, it's, that's just a very rough description of the problem. Actually, this, time, this one dimension in, uh, for calorie intake, that's really just sort of a principal component. There are actually, there's sort of a lot, a lot of different other dimensions. There's the fat calorie intake, and there's the sugar calorie intake, and there's the starch intake, and there's the protein intake, and all of them have sort of slightly different effects on your body weight. But they sort of, they all kind of, they're sort of collinear in that they, they all, they're all about gaining weight, right? If you take more of this stuff, you gain weight. And then there's this other dimension, which is you can go on runs, you can, you can do, like, you, you can go to the gym, you can, you can exercise with free weights, you can go rowing, or whatever your favorite sport is, right? And they all have slightly different effects. If I go and play football or soccer, right, then parts of my body are going to change and other parts are not going to change. And if I go and lift weights, then maybe my, like, my upper arms are going to change, but my legs are not going to change that much. It's a very complicated process. The human body is a hugely complicated process. And we're just talking about our body. We're not talking about the brain at all. Right? So actually, this is very important. This is a, the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make here is that these physical systems that we study in machine learning are a lot more complicated than these very, very drilled down simplistic models that physicists are studying, for example. They are also much, much more complicated than the sort of isolated, separate systems that biologists are studying to a large degree. We have these extremely complicated systems, and that necessita necessitates that we're simplifying our models a little bit. We need to actually say which part we're interested in, and then we need to carefully think about which parts we're ignoring. Okay, so let's see what's happening here with this. So I'm, I've decided I'm going to use this particular model. So now the first thing I did was I computed, given the actual data, which is this line here, I computed the marginal probability for this data given all these parameters and this structure of the model. So that's exactly what I did on the previous slides, now for just for this particular model. And I did maximum likelihood inference. So I fed this function to an optimizer, an optimization uh, algorithm, and let it find the maximum, post, uh, not, not posterior, just the maximum likelihood solution for these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers. Okay? Eight numbers is reasonably okay in terms of identification because I have quite a lot of data points. And well, actually, I shouldn't say that because there are sometimes very subtle effects about how, how, how well identified a, a parameter is relative to a number of data points. But for this particular model, it seemed to be reasonably well identified. But of course, this whole being identified aspect hinges entirely on this structure of the model that I've decided to use. If I would have decided to drop the Wiener process or drop the square exponential, I would have gotten maybe slightly different answers. Okay? Now, once I fix these hyperparameters, then 
everything is a Gaussian model. Right? So now it's just Gaussian process regression. And now I can make use of all this great Gaussian process algebra. So for example, I can say, I'm sorry about this huge math slide. Um, I could say, what is this function I've actually seen? So I've seen this function f, which is my weight over time, which is a sum of all these functions. Right? It's a sum of a square exponential uh, draw, plus a Wiener draw, plus these linear functions, which are uh, encoding my lifestyle choices. Okay? So in terms of a prior, I can write this as there are these individual functions and these individual weights for these effects of these lifestyle choices. What I get to see is the sum of all of these things. And this is a complicated way of encoding a sum. Now that sum, that's just a linear map. Right? Gaussians are closed under linear maps. So this is my overall Gaussian process prior is this thing I just showed you. This is where I, draw this, where, where I drew the, the functions from. Is this Gaussian distribution. And it has this mean function, which is very boring. It's just a zero. Actually, it's not a zero. It's, a, it's the, the overall mean of my body weight over the past four years. Um, and which, which is actually, so that's actually something missing here. So th that these are all zero, and then there's another final term, which is just, I'm just adding the overall mean. So I'm sort of standardizing my data set in a, in a way. Um, and then there are these individual variances, uh, which are encoded by these hyperparameters and the kernel shapes. And I sum over all of them to get my data set. That's actually what you do when you sum kernels. Like summing kernels means that there's several, if you, if you sum two kernels, that's like saying there are actually two functions, and I'm just getting to see the sum over those two functions. Now, what you care about is just the individual functions, right? You would like to know the individual single functions. Can you figure those out? You just nod or like shake your heads a little bit or like, not, not this, this is difficult. Okay, exactly. So you can, I'm not sure whether marginalization is the right word, but yes is definitely the right answer. So you can just ask, you can just ask, what are these individual functions, right? Well, I've, I've observed the sum over them. That's okay. We know how to do inference, right? You remember the, 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 the third slide yesterday? Where we had this sort of overall two-dimensional Gaussian. You observe the sum of two variables, butter and milk. You can still ask what butter and milk, like what's the probability over butter and milk, right? It's just, yeah, okay, actually, you're right. It's marginalization. Ah, I agree. It's actually exactly the right way. So here's the actual computation you do. Your posterior over the, let's say, the weight for going on, going regul on regular runs is um, the prior mean minus, and this is just a sort of rewriting this term that you've now seen several times, the covariance between the thing that I'm interested in and the thing that I got to observe, and that's exactly this, because that's just this part up here, times the overall covariance of all data points, and that's this thing here, which I've def defined in this part, times the difference between the predicted observations and the actual observations. That's the mean. And if you go through this and think about the algebraic form of this, this is a vector, this is a matrix, this is a row vector, then you notice that what comes out here is just a number. And that's okay. That's exactly the physical effect we're looking for. That's this number of how many grams per day am I losing on average if I go on regular runs. And this is the posterior variance over that. That posterior variance is actually larger than the uncertainty at every single data point or, or in, in the actual overall plot. Why? Because of explaining away. So on the plot on that I had yesterday, if you have this kind of prior over, over some parameters, then you make this kind of observation, then you get this kind of posterior out. Now you're actually quite certain about the sum of those two things, which is the function I'm interested in. But if I marginalize, I'm actually still quite uncertain about this individual number, right? There's some nodding. I like that. That's good. Okay. So what are the actual numbers? Okay. So these are the numbers that I got out. So if I go on runs regularly, I lose about 29 grams a day, plus minus 7. Um, if I slack off, I gain about 10 grams a day, plus minus 4. Um, if I try to eat less, I lose about 21 grams a day, plus minus 6. If I go to the gym, I'm not actually sure. I might lose some, I might gain some. Not quite clear, because it's, it's minus 2 plus minus 3. And if I go on a vegetarian diet, nothing happens. That's weird. Why is that? Ah, but if I don't have enough data, shouldn't, shouldn't the error bar just be very large? 
because I'm really uncertain about what's going on. But I'm actually very certain about the zero. Actually, I'm not. This algorithm is very certain. No, that's, it not, that's not it either. This is overfitting. It's my optimizer. Whenever I say optimizer, I set an alarm bell going off, oh, now we're fitting something. Fitting can give overfitting. What I've done is I've handed these hyperparameters to, the, to this optimization algorithm, and it's decided that the best way to explain this data is to just say there's no effect whatsoever in this vegetarian diet. Why? Because, it's a, because it helps me make this model more parsimonious. Right? The overall uh, um, the sort of probability, the, the, the volume over which I have to spread probability is a lot smaller if I can get rid of one parameter in my model. It turns an eight-dimensional model into a seven-dimensional model. And that's sort of exponentially less volume to wonder about. So that's what this thing has done. That's not saying that there is no effect. Right? It's just saying that the maximum likelihood answer is not a good description of, what's of the real uncertainty about this effect. So what should I have done to not have this effect? OK, so I could have just done, I, I could have just eaten vegetarian for several years. That's a good point. Now, given that I have this data set and I can't do anything about it, because normally in machine learning settings, you don't get to change your lifestyle. You have your patients or your people you work with where the data comes from. Is that an algorithmic thing? Yes. So if I could have been Bayesian about this parameter. Right? I could have had a prior over it, and I could have tried to actually marginalize out over it. That would have certainly given me a lot more uncertainty. So I could have done this by MCMC. I didn't have the time to this because I did it last week. So you could think about doing this. It's certainly up to you to improve these, these kind of computations. I could also have done, tried to do something sort of sneaky. I could have just put a big prior on what these numbers could possibly be. And then the maximum likelihood answer would turn into a maximum a posteriori answer. And maybe that would be a bit, little bit better. Zubin would be very unhappy about this idea because it's not Bayesian. But maybe you want to try it. right? OK, um, now, so these are, these are the five scalar variables. The, uh, these are things you could put on a table. There are also these two functions, the Wiener function and the uh, square exponential function. Those you might also be interested in. Um, these you have to plot, because they are functions. You can't just write them in a table. So this is what I've done here. This is the posterior distribution over these random fluctuations in the, uh, on the square exponential. So you can see that this is relatively broad because of this effect. And it, the, the optimizer has decided that it's sort of on the range of about two kilograms up and down. That's the overall effect. And you can see there's actually a lot of sort of really wiggly noise up and down. But it looks very unstructured. That's a good thing because I claimed that it's very unstructured. If it would look very structured, there'd be something going on that I haven't explained yet. This is the posterior over um, the Wiener process part this thing up here. I've also plotted all the effects in there to sort of make it easier to interpret, and I've plotted it in the data set again. And so this one, it looks reasonably like a random walk. As you can see, it's very different from the data, right? So it's not explaining all the data. It's just something else on top. But there's definitely structure in there. And you can look at this and say, there's something going on. So what's happened here is there were, there were other lifestyle choices I haven't properly described yet. Or these linear models for my lifestyle choices are not just not good descriptions. Maybe going to the gym has a much more complicated effect. I mean, there's sort of an onset and then a tail, and, which I actually think is probably true. So it's very difficult to explain this. It's very difficult to come, come up with a good model for it. You can also see this, this is sort of, I should maybe have a feature that's called Christmas and mom. Right? That's just something that's living here. And then uh, maybe actually in 2011, maybe not so much. But in, uh, yeah, maybe it was just in 2010. Maybe I just had a, had a depressive Christmas. I don't know. OK. Um, now, imagine, or should we, no, actually, OK. Other thing first. Um, what I can now do is I can do, I can do predictions. So I can say, this is my posterior over the data set, uh, given a model which just uses the features I've shown you so far, and a, a, a feature for going to the gym which ends a week before the summer school. So if after the summer school I just stop going to the gym, this is what I think my weight is going to continue to do. Right? I can also have another model with a feature that just continues the going to the gym part over here, and then this is what might happen. So this is a sort of minor way of telling me it's maybe a good idea to keep going to the gym. Right? You'll keep losing some weight. Okay? Um, I'm actually not just doing that. I'm doing quite complicated things as well. So you've all uh, done this lab tour. Last week, you've seen this, you've heard about the scanner in Michael Black's department. 
you can of course collect all sorts of other data. So what I'm doing at the moment is every week or every other week I go over there into the cellar and meet with uh, um, um, someone who takes a picture of me standing, standing in the scanner. So I've got a 300 dimensional data set of my body shape over the past uh, year or so, half year by now. And now you could ask what are the principal components of that, what's actually the effect of going to the gym and all sorts of things. Of course not everyone has this at home, but soon you might have it at home because uh, they are working on a version of this for full Kinect, right? So imagine you can stand in front of your Kinect every morning in your underwear and it tells you, you should go on a run today because clearly for the past two weeks you've been eating way too much, right? <laughs> that would be great. We also had a, a high school student here uh, in the summer of last year called Carsten Roth. Um, by now he's just finished his, his A-levels and he wrote actually uh, and an algorithm very similar to this. It doesn't have these features, but it's, it's performing regression on body weight, and he's just made it into an app that might be on the App Store from like today or so. He also has a video that I'm going to show at the end of this, of this talk. Okay. What I'm trying to say with all of these, all of these, like this little experiment, is we can build these very expressive, complicated models. There's nonlinear effects, random walks, linear effects. You can also, of course, have nonlinear features. And then ask for the strength of each individual effect and sort of separate out individual effects in these data sets that consist of um, uh, superpositions of, of observations. That's, that's a, a, sort of a great property of these Gaussian process models. But they, are all, they always hinge on prior assumptions. That's actually not a property of Gaussian process models. It's a property of every single model. And that's maybe something to sort of take home and think about a little bit. I don't have a good answer to this. So imagine I would write up all this in a paper and send it to, I don't know, the British Journal of Medicine and say, I have a generative model for body weight. Right? And imagine you are my reviewer. Now, what would, what would you say? They say, what is this silly prior assumption? It's a linear effect. You're assuming random walks. Why is this a good, a good prior assumption? You have to tell me whether that's a good prior assumption. Okay, so then I, I, get, I get the paper back. I'm, I'm disappointed, as always, when I get papers back. Right? I change the model. Right? I put, put something else in. I put more, more parameters in. I can put like 50,000 different effects in that I can come, come up with. I run my super Bayesian posterior inference. And what it's going to tell me is I don't know anything. There's nothing. It's just, there's just no structure whatsoever. It could be anything. Because as you, as you keep adding more and more degrees of freedom, you'll just become more and more uncertain. So then I say, silly reviewer, I'll just try again. I'll throw all this crap out again. I come up with a different model, the one that the reviewer proposed, right? Write it all up, out come some slightly different numbers. Hopefully they are not that different, but maybe they're slightly different, right? Okay, and then I, I don't know, I can, oh, maybe I can calculate some p-values or something. Maybe I can add it, like maybe I can send, put all this, all this data, the corrected data set corrected for all these effects in SPSS and click a few buttons and see if I can get a good p-value out, right? Then it's consistent. Okay, then I send it off again. And now I'm, I'm, I'm unlucky, I get a different reviewer who says, why don't you include a Wiener process? This might be a very good idea. I think this is actually, okay, this is a, a caricature, but I think this is, there's, a, there's a real problem with scientific research in structured, complicated systems. And as, a, as, as the community studying these extremely complicated systems, this is a very simple example, right? We have people in this institute studying uh, the, co the, co the co correlation between SNPs and phenotypes, and there is these are million dimensional data sets. It's extremely difficult to argue why a particular model is the right one or not. If you're a particle physicist, then you can say, I've sort of figured out everything and I've stripped down this problem to just one particular particle and I've repeated the experiment 10,000 times and I can really say that this is repeatable and it's always the same answer. Okay, but if you have this kind of data set, I cannot repeat this. I cannot go back to 2009, do the same thing again. I can't get a clone of myself, do, do the exact same thing 20 times. This is just a one-off thing. I could get 20 people do something similar. That would help, maybe. I could also try to intervene to some kind of causal inference. But it's very difficult in these kind of systems because I can't sort of p change parts of my body. I can't change the, sort of the effect that exercise has on me and not change the effect that calorie intake has on me. So it's very difficult to do these things right. And it's an argument that I, I can't give a sort of concise answer or, or final answer to. It's maybe something we just need to discuss. Okay. That was a real experiment. Now let's do a little bit more for the last, last 20 minutes. Just a sort of a minor comment on um, more generally these 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 models. Yes.
well, I've essentially already used the predictive performance here to optimize the hyperparameters. When you, when you ma maximize marginal likelihood, you, predict, you, you optimize predictive performance on, uh, on the test set. Okay, now you could try on a training set, yeah. Um, the difficulty is I can't really produce the exact same outputs, right? Okay, so to a certain extent you can try that, huh? But uh, I can only try it sort of, you know, I can, I can say, okay, now I'm going to try and do the exact same runs again that I did when I was, when I was in Cambridge. And then I should get the exact same effect out. But actually, over in the same time, I also changed my diet, so it's very difficult to reproduce. So, yeah. But up to some simplifications like that, yes. Okay, so something I need to point out because um, Francesco is, uh, and, and Peter reminded me that this was a, a, a problem in, or a sort of a discovery in, in your practical sessions over and over again, is the relationship between these Gaussian process models and frequentist uh, least squares regression. I think there's, there's what we at the moment have, we have two communities that, that work on very similar related models. They talk very little to each other and they write papers in a separate way and don't always notice how related they are. This is something I would like to point out. Obviously, some of you will already know, but as I hear from Francesco, many of you don't know. So, if you take the log of, let's say we only care about the maximum of the Gaussian posterior. That's also known as the mean. It's this big red line in the middle of the posterior that I've always plotted in the plot so far. Then, where is that maximum? Well, it's the maximum of this posterior here. That's what the posterior is. Um, if I'm only interested in the maximum, I can take the logarithm of the distribution because the logarithm is a monotonic function and it doesn't change the location of the maximum. Okay, so if I take the logarithm of this, then first of all, this black thing here, the normalization constant, just drops out because it just becomes a constant that doesn't matter for the maximum. Um, and what I'm left with is the pr is the logarithm of this product of two Gaussians. That's the sum over the logarithm of two Gaussians. What's the logarithm of a Gaussian? Well, it's a quadratic form, right? It's uh, this is the logarithm of this factorizing likelihood. There's a normalization constant which drops out because it's a constant. Plus, this is the logarithm of the prior, and there's this kernel matrix in here. Plus a normalization constant, which is a constant, so I drop it out. Okay, what is this? Well, that's the L2 loss, right? It's the distance between the predictions and the observed data weighted by the observation noise. And it's literally just an L2 loss. This thing here is also an L2 loss, but it's a scaled L2 loss. It's an, it's an L2 loss between covariant function values, which are sort of scaled by this inverse kernel gram matrix. Um, there's various ways of calling this. You could, you could call it a, a, a Hilbert, space lo Hilbert space loss, or it's just an L2 loss, just an L space, a, a scaled L2 loss. OK, so what this is, is an L2 regularized least squares estimator. So if you're doing least squares regression, because you sort of call yourself a frequentist and you don't like this whole Gaussian process Bayesian stuff, and you're doing something that's extremely closely related to these things. And if you call yourself a Bayesian and you don't like this whole frequentist estimation stuff, but you end up looking at the mean of your Gaussian process posterior, then you're really looking at an L2 regularized least squares loss. You're looking a little bit bored. Is it, is, it, is it actually interesting new observation? For how, many, how many of you knew about this before in this particular relationship? Okay, it's about half of you. That's good. Okay. This way of doing regression is also known as kernel rich regression sometimes. Some people call it kernel regression, but that's technically wrong. There's something else that's also called kernel regression, which is quite different from it. Uh, so I have this very dangerous sentence here that regularizes our prior. Zubin would hate me for that. It's obviously not the same. But in terms of maximization, the maximum in the maximum a posteriori sense, the effect of a regularizer is the effect of a logarithmic prior. So there is a strong relationship in terms of the location of the maximum. Of course, a prior is more than just its maximum, it's its overall shape as well. But that means this is actually a very great sort of coincidence, because it means that we can in this particular case study the way that frequentist analysis works on a particular model and the way Bayesian analysis works on a particular model and compare the two and force them to talk to each other because they are the same thing, right? The maximum of this posterior is the same thing as this L2 regularized loss. And here is sort of just this sort of uh, drill this home again um, to make the connection to what Bernhard talked about before. So um, here is sort of 
a very, very, very high level, very simplistic picture of how frequent distance analysis of these methods works. Work, you, you'll hear a lot more about it tomorrow, I think, from Ingo Steinbart uh, in learning theory, at least I assume so. So the way you can think about this posterior here, this fat red line in the middle, not the rest of the distribution, but this fat red line, is that it is this object here, right? This is this posterior mean. What is this thing? This is a matrix, this is the data, and this is a kernel, right? It's the evaluation of the kernel at every point you want to predict at and every point where you have made observations. Now this thing here, given the data, that's just a vector, right? It's just a vector mapped through an inverse matrix that together is just a vector. You could call that a weight vector alpha. And then what this is, what this prediction is, is just a weighted sum over kernels located at each of the observations. These are these kernels up here. So I've taken these, for this particular case, these RBF kernels, right? At, every, at each of the points I've had observations and I've weighted them by that little alpha. So this is what they look like now. If you sum over all these gray lines, you get out the big red line. That's what this predictive object is. Now, to understand how powerful this, these, these methods are, you could ask, well, what's the space of all the functions that I can describe by these sums of, by these finitely many weight, or at least sort of uh, convergent sums of, um, of kernel functions. And that space, with some simplification, we're leaving out of lots of details here, is called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, SDRKHS. The space of functions I can write as the sum of these things. Potentially infinitely many of these things, but it has to be a convergent sum. It has to be uh, absolutely summable. Okay. Um, I have to make a sort of important note here. Ask me, ask me if you would like to know more about this after the talk. Bayesians at this point like to point out, and it's a very important point, that this only applies to the mean of this Gaussian process. Draws from a Gaussian process are not elements of the RKHS, absolutely, uh, uh, almost surely. So uh, there's a complicated technical thing about this. I can tell you more about, uh, about this after the talk. If you're interested in it, just ask me. It's actually very nice and interesting. It's just generally, if someone talks about draws from a Gaussian process, they are not elements of some Hilbert space that is the RKHS. That's just wrong. But the mean is. Okay. So, now, here's a interest, very interesting property about some kernels, and that is that they are universal. What that means is, let's say this is the space of all functions, of all continuous functions, uh, that map from the real line to the real line, or from an, actually from a Euclidean vector space to the real line. That's that space. They're all in here, every single function. This is the sign somewhere. This is some really ugly sort of wiggly function somewhere else. Now, this RKHS, the space of all these functions that can be described in this sum over uh, kernels, for certain kernels, lies dense in this space. So it lies dense in the same way that the rational numbers lie dense in the real numbers. So for any function in that space and any epsilon larger than zero, which uh, and some norm that measures similarity in function space, I can give you an element of the RKHS, which is um, less than epsilon close to this function you're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, that sounds like a very powerful statement. In fact, it is a very powerful statement. It's saying, I can approximate any function, any continuous function, in this way. All right? So this means kernel-rich regression, using a universal kernel, is a universal learning machine. It can learn any function. That sounds amazing, right? Um, it could also mean that Gaussian process regression models maybe can learn any function. There's more subtleties there. Let's just sort of leave that out. But kernel-rich regression can learn any function. And the square exponential kernel has this property. It's a universal kernel. That's one of the reasons why it's very, very popular. There are other kernels that have the property as well. The rational quadratic, for example, has it as well. I think the matern kernel has it as well. Or the matern family has it as well. Okay, so that was, when, when this was uh, pointed out, I think this is actually not the first paper that pointed this out. It's just the one where I sort of got some of the results from. Um, this seemed to some people like a, like a very, very powerful statement, right? It means you can learn any function. It's a universal learning machine. Okay, and notice that this is the mean of our Gaussian process. So if you only care about the mean, it's the same thing. So maybe our Gaussian process mean can learn everything. Okay, let's see how well this works. Let's do an experiment, because I like to do plots, and I don't understand this complicated math. Okay, so let's see how well this actually works. Here is um, this green thing in the background. That is a Gaussian process prior using the square exponential kernel with length scale one, signal variance one. 
that's a universal learning machine. You can learn any function. It's a universal kernel. So at least this mean, this posterior mean, can learn any function. Not so sure about the uncertainty, but the mean can learn any function. Here is any function, just some function. So I got this function by drawing from some other Gaussian process, which is not the one that we're using here, but it's one that's almost the same. It's a rational quadratic kernel, which has the same hyperparameters. So it actually has the same length scale, so that the length scale parameters here are exactly the same. The overall scale is also the same, as you can see, the sort of this function lies nicely within the prior. Okay, let's see how well this works, this learning. Okay, first data point, posterior turns in. Good, 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 you're learning something. Looks very good. Third, third data point, fifth data point, Tenth data point. This looks pretty good, right? We're learning this function really well. Twenty. Oh, that's not good. Something went wrong there. Okay. Hmm. Well, but it's a universal learning machine, right? It's, well, it's just a step out of the limit. Let's add some more data points. Fifty. Oh, gets worse. A hundred. Oh my God, this is a really bad model. Now we've got five hundred evaluations. Actually, now we're getting a bit closer, but it looks horrible. It's very, very unstable. And what I'm not showing you, actually, if I would move to minus 9 here, you'd see this function move up to 10 to the 13. And then come down again and move to one, mi minus 10 to the 13. And then oscillate up and down like crazy. OK, that doesn't sound good. OK, let's see. So this is actually a plot. I've, what I did with this experiment, I also have a held out data set here that consists of 10,000 function evaluations of this exact function. And I'm just evaluating the predictive error of this red line on these 10,000 points as a function of how often I've evaluated this function, OK? Um, this is one data point, two, and so on. This is a logarithmic plot, and this is also a logarithmic plot, and this red line is the error. And I had to stop here, because that's when my MATLAB started making, uh, causing trouble. Once, once you have like 2,000, 4,000 data points, and have to invert a matrix of size 4,000 by 4,000, it just takes uh, quite a long time, so I stopped doing that there. OK, this is what this error behaves like. OK, this part, maybe there's just something wrong with the model. But then it actually kind of does something smart, OK? But if you sort of think about how this line will continue, it doesn't look anything like it'll, it'll continue to drop at a linear rate. So this is a log-log plot. So and the optimal statistical estimator, the, the estimator whose, whose predictive error would drop with the square root of the number of observations, would have a, a, a behavior like this green line here. And I've made it sort of look as good as it could possibly be. I could also have moved this up and down. I'm, I'm pretty sure this line will not continue like this. It's more likely to continue like this yellow line here, which is a logarithmic decay in the, in the, in the, in the arrow. Um, in fact, this is, I'm not making this up. There's a, there's a very nice paper on this by Art van der Vaart and Jan van Zanten from two years ago, where they um, studied exactly this phenomenon and point out that, um, well, speaking very loosely, there's, there's a lot more to these Gaussian process priors slash kernel rich regression algorithms than just their limiting behavior. And there's also a lot more to their structure than just the fact that they give you continuous functions. They make all sorts of very intricate assumptions about, the f about well, other aspects of the, of the, the function. In particular, for these uh, square exponential kernels, they make assumptions about the, 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 the power spectrum, the Fourier power spectrum of the function. So if you have a function that doesn't fit into these kind of assumptions, then your convergence can be very bad. And they, have this ex they, they make this particular example of a square exponential kernel learning from a rational quadratic kernel and show that convergence is less logarithmic. Logarithmic is horrible. That means you need exponentially many data points to lower your, your, your error. Right? So that means it essentially doesn't work. It doesn't matter that it will converge eventually, that it's consistent. It just converges exponentially slowly. That's like not converging at all. And this is a one-dimensional problem. And I need it. It's from minus 8 to 8. And the length scale is 1. So this is like 16 independent draws, basically, right? And I need 10, like 4,000 data points to get my error down reasonably. And there's something really crazy happening in between. Now, your real data set that you're working with out there has 40 dimensions, 400 dimensions, 2,000 dimensions. Your data set consists of 100 data points, 200 data points, 500 data points, maybe 10,000 if you're lucky. You'll never get to this kind of regime. You'll always be somewhere here. So if you get your model wrong, it doesn't matter that you're using a universal kernel. And it doesn't matter that you use this cool RBF square exponential kernel that can learn any function. You just won't necessarily get a good answer. What you have to do is you have to think about the prior assumptions that the model makes and make sure you've got a good model that actually converges well, using hopefully the kind of techniques that I showed you yesterday and today. So here's this connection between, between the two the two sort of schools of thought talking to each other, the Bayesians and the frequentists. 
this kind of object, this Gaussian process prior, this is obviously owned by the, by the Bayesian. The Bayesian says, and this is, like, I'm trying to sort of paraphrase the thought processes that are sort of philosophically happening when we do inference. The Bayesian says, this is a generative process for some data. I'm claiming this is the correct generative process for the data I got to observe. If this is the correct generative process for the data, then I know the optimal statistical estimator for the, 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 the true function given observations, and that's given by Bayes' theorem. Right? And we've done this for the past one and a half lectures. The frequentist has, owns this big line here in the middle, the mean, and says, this is an estimator, and it's a universal estimator that will converge to any function given enough learning data. Okay? So they now they've both made their statements, these sort of hypothetical figures in the corner, and they're beginning to learn, and then this happens. And then I go to the Bayesian and said, why did you tell me this would be a good method? This doesn't work at all. And the Bayesian says, yeah, but it's the wrong prior. You should have used a different prior. Right? If only you would have told me that was the correct pro uh, generative process for your data, everything would have been a lot better. And obviously, you can't, you can't expect this to work if you get the prior wrong. And that's annoying because you never know what the right prior is, right? So that's a really silly kind of answer. Okay, so then I go to the frequentist and say, come on, help, help, help me out. What, what's going on here? This doesn't work at all. And you told me it would be a universal estimator. When a frequentist says, well, you've only collected 20 data points so far. You should collect infinitely many data points. Go out again and can collect 10 billion data points. Then it's going to work. That's also not useful because that's my data set. I can't get more data points. That's what I have. Right? And it does not, it's not working really well. So there's, I mean, obviously I'm sort of making very, very uh, contentious statements here, but I'm sort of trying to point out that both of these schools of thoughts have their limitations. I think just speaking very generally and philosophically, if I may, in the past three minutes of this talk, the, um, this, you in here, this generation, maybe I'm a part of it as well, I don't know. We, we need to sort out, we, we, we maybe need to stop shouting at each other about being Bayesian and being frequentist, because both have this kind of problem. And they both have their problems in their own way, they just talk about it in a different way. The previous generation, people like Zubin, and I don't know, Bernhard or other people, they had to fight for their right to talk in particular ways, and they had to fight for their right to, to think about problems in a particular way. And it was important that they made these very strong statements and they helped the community on a lot. I think what we need to do now is to think more about sort of not shouting at each other that much, I'm actually not going to show this, and instead try to focus on the good aspects of these, of, of these two schools of thought and use them both to construct good methods. Here's how you use, in my opinion, the Bayesian framework in a, in a meaningful way. What a Bayesian framework gives you is a generative model for, for data. So you can look at those draws, you can look at what they, what they look like and whether they're good models. This is a way of building good models. It's also a way of sort of, as Zubin pointed out, constru automatically constructing sort of black box algorithms that can sort out every possible problem you could have just by telling you, you just need to solve this very complicated integral here and then that's exactly what you need to be doing. It's very nice, because it means you don't have to think, you don't have to come up with, with estimators. It also gives a good, good intuition for properties, as I said. You can generate data points, you can sort of try to get a feeling for what your model does in the way that I showed you with my weight data before. Right? You look at what you can generate, see whether it's a good model. It's a, it's a framework that's helpful for small data sets, which almost all data sets are, and for sort of extrapolation for, for predicting things where there's lots of structure underneath where you can't assume IID data, um, IID setups. It's also just for, for many people just an, a convenient way of working because maybe you've learned to work in this sort of computing way. So for me, I like this way of working because I'm a physicist and I like to write down a formula and solve an integral and then just write a paper, right? There's, uh, or just have a method that works depending on whether you care about papers or about the real world. Um, the frequentist method also helps us because it helps us getting a feeling for what happens if the model isn't quite right. And that's a huge, that's really important because most of our models aren't quite right. It gives us a feeling for what the limitations of a model are, what things that cannot, what things our algorithm cannot possibly learn, whether where the restrictions of the, of the model class are. They are often quite subtle, they're very difficult to understand. It can also sometimes give us very good shortcuts. Some, some estimators are just so much faster than Bayesian computations, and they can really speed up our algorithms. It can help us build general models. So if you want to have a good model, you need to think a little bit in a Bayesian way, and then if you want to make sure the model actually works, if your assumptions aren't quite right, you need to think a little bit in a frequentist way. It's also helpful for large data sets because it tends to be a bit cheaper than Bayesian algorithms. So these are the two kind of statements that I've already made before. I think 
I'm going to leave, it, I'll leave the sermon at this, and instead I'm going to sum up uh, and end. I have found a nice uh, quote from Henri Poincaré, one of the great heroes of both fields. Um, my French pronunciation is really bad, so I'm just going to translate into English. I hope uh, that's okay for the French people in the room. As far as I understand this sentence, he's saying one mustn't have some, some, some form of superstition about this method of least squares, which you may also call Gaussian process regression. It supposes, in effect, that there is no systematic error in your observations, and there is always a systematic error in your observations. That's exactly, well, this is a much more succinct way of phrasing what I try to do with my weight example. You have to come up with a model, and your model is always wrong. So you shouldn't assume this to do some magic. There's no reason to have some superstition about these methods. Nevertheless, they are extremely powerful in an algebraic sense. Because you can use the simple kernel algebra to construct these very elaborate methods. And I've shown you a very simpl simplistic form of this. Obviously, you can go out and read papers that do much, much more complicated things. You can combine kernels algebraically, uh, algebraically to build more and more expressive models. This is a way of giving you good modeling performance, but it's not universal. There's no, no magic behind that. You can infer hyperparameters using, for example, Bayesian hierarchical inference. If you don't like that, then go out and do cross-validation. I don't mind. Um, but your results of this process always depend on your prior choices about other parts of the structure of the model. If you don't want to make any of these prior choices, you're going to end up not learning anything. So, or just maybe you end up ignoring them and claiming that you're not making assumptions, which is just incorrect. You can use this Gaussian process regression to separate out superposed effects from data sets that are superpositions of, of individual effects. So I showed you, but you need to be careful about the prior assumptions to make sure you can make some kind of um, scientific statement. Both the frequentist and the Bayesian interpretation of these methods are helpful, and there's no reason to say, I only use Gaussian process regression because I'm a Bayesian, and I only use kernel rich regression because I'm a frequentist, because they happen to be extremely closely related. And both communities can learn from each other in the way that they think about these methods. Later on today, in, in the afternoon, after lunch, when you are all satiated again and sort of falling asleep, um, I'll do a more high-level talk on the more crazy things you can do with Gaussians, and uh, essentially sort of talk, tell you a little bit about, about my own work, and hopefully give you a feeling that these methods don't always have to produce one-dimensional plots of something relatively simplistic like my body weight. They can also learn very, very complicated things and can be used for really cool, powerful applications. Thank you. Okay, questions? Yeah. Wait. So can we also be uh, Bayesian, I guess, and do hierarchical inference on the kernel itself and sort of yes. learn the kernels? And sometimes yes. these are just positive definite matrices. Yes, so there is this, okay, ah. So there's a second part of your, of your question. Um, uh, it's very interesting. So the first part of the question is, can we be Bayesian on the kernel itself? So can we decide which kernel to use? And I kind of, mentioned this in the he here, right? So you could ask about this alge like algebraic structure of this, of the kernel. And there's this wonderful paper in uh, ICML 2013, whose authors and title I've unfortunately forgot, but we should look up and it's something about kernel alphabets or so, right? Essentially, you have a generative process, like some tree structure, where you sort of think about all sorts of combinations of kernels you could possibly try, and then try them out. What you need, though, is a prior over these things, because the space is not measurable. You need to make it measurable. And now your other question is, can I parameterize the kernel space and find a general non-parametric method? I think this, just, this is essentially just another parameterization of the same problem. So if you have an, a better, maybe smarter way of optimizing in this space that involves some other parameterization, that would be really cool. I would love to see that paper. So if you want to look up that paper, it's by ah. James Lloyd and David Duvenot ah, wonderful. at ICML 2013. Good. See, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that my PhD students know the papers better than I do. Okay, I think we have some questions from the observation room. Yeah. Yes, so is it trivial to generalize this Gaussian process idea to the uh, vector value function and sort of more structure output space? Thank you. Yes, um, so th this, the simple answer is, uh, Okay, I, don't, I, have a, I have a plot in the to this afternoon where I just sort of allude to this again. You, 
what a Gaussian process is, is a distribution over a set of real numbers that co-vary with each other. And, well, sorry, not, not, yeah, a set of real numbers that co-vary with each other. Whatever you can build with real numbers, you can build with a Gaussian process. You can build curves out of them, because curves are a set of real numbers that are assigned to values along a one-dimensional space, right, time. Um, if you can take, I don't know, apples and oranges and the space of all fruits, that's a structured output, as far as I understand, and um, find some Euclidean embedding of, of this space that somehow says, like, apples are the vector 1, 0, 0, and oranges are the vector 0, 1, 0, then uh, you can also do regression on structured outputs. I am no, in no way knowledgeable about this, though, and after the break, we have Thomas Hofmann here, who is the absolute expert on it, so he can tell you exactly how this works, and he'll probably tell you that it's not all a Gaussian process. It's a lot more than that. <laughs>